Chapter 1. Why did you let your eyes so rest on me and hold your breath between? In all the ages this can never be as if it had not been. Mary Elizabeth Coleridge, a moment. Of all the couples sitting in the Rivoli bar at the Ritz that Thursday evening, the pair that was having the most conspicuously good time was not, in fact, a couple. Cormoran Strike and Robin Ellicott, private detectives, business partners, and self-declared best friends, were celebrating Robin's 30th birthday. Both had been slightly self-conscious on first arriving in the bar, which resembled an art deco jewel box with its walls of dark wood and gold and its frosted panels of lalique glass, because each was aware that this outing was unique in the almost five years they'd known one another. Never before had they chosen to spend an evening in each other's company outside work, without the presence of other friends or colleagues, or the pretext of injury, because there'd been an occasion a few weeks previously when Strike had accidentally given his partner two black eyes and bought her a takeaway curry as recompense. Even more unusually, both had had enough sleep, and each was looking their best. Robin was wearing a figure-hugging blue dress, her long strawberry blonde hair clean and loose, and her partner had noticed the appreciative glances she'd drawn from male drinkers as she passed. He'd already complimented her on the opal lying in the hollow at the base of her throat, which had been a 30th birthday gift from her parents. The tiny diamonds surrounding it made a glittering halo in the bar's golden lights, and whenever Robin moved, sparks of scarlet fire twinkled in the opal's depths. Strike was wearing his favourite Italian suit with a white shirt and dark tie. His resemblance to a broken-nosed, slightly overweight Beethoven had increased now that he'd shaved off his recently grown beard. But the waitress's warm smile as she handed Strike his first old-fashioned reminded Robin of what her ex-husband's new wife, Sarah Shadlock, had once said of the detective. He is strangely attractive, isn't he? Bit beaten up looking, but I've never minded that. What a liar she'd been. Sarah had liked her men smoothly handsome, as proven by her relentless and ultimately successful pursuit of Matthew. Sitting facing each other in leopard print chairs at their table for two, Strike and Robin had initially subsumed their slight awkwardness in work talk. Discussion of the cases currently on the detective agency's books carried them through a powerful cocktail apiece, by which time their increasingly loud laughter had started drawing glances from both barmen and customers. Soon Robin's eyes were bright, her face slightly flushed, and even Strike, who was considerably larger than his partner and well able to handle his alcohol, had taken enough bourbon to make him feel pleasantly buoyant and loose-limbed. After their second cocktails, talk became more personal. Strike, who was the illegitimate son of a rock star he'd met only twice, told Robin that one of his half-sisters, Prudence, wanted to meet him. Where does she fit in? Robin asked. She knew that Strike's father had been married three times and that her partner was the result of a one-night stand with a woman most commonly described in the press as a super groupie, but she was hazy about the rest of the family tree. She's the other illegitimate, said Strike, a few years younger than me. Her mother was that actress, Lindsay Fanthorpe, mixed race woman. She's been in everything, EastEnders, The Bill. Do you want to meet Prudence? Not sure. Strike admitted, can't help feeling I've got enough relatives to be going on with. She's also a therapist. What kind? Jungian. His expression, which compounded wariness and distaste, made Robin laugh. What's wrong with being a Jungian therapist? I don't know. I quite liked her from a text, but... Trying to find the right words, Strike's eyes found the bronze panel on the wall behind Robin's head, which showed a naked leader being impregnated by Zeus in the form of a swan. Well, she said she hadn't had an easy time of it either, having him as a father, but when I found out what she does for a living, his voice trailed away. He drank more bourbon. You thought she was being insincere? Not exactly insincere. Strike heaved a sigh. I've had enough matchbox psychologists telling me why I live the way I do and tracing it all back to my family, so-called. Prudence said in one of her texts that she'd found forgiving Rokeby healing. Sod this, said Strike abruptly. It's your birthday. Let's talk about your family. What does your dad do for a living? You've never told me. Oh, haven't I? said Robin with mild surprise. 
He's a professor of sheep medicine production and reproduction. Strike choked on his cocktail. What's funny? Robin asked, eyebrows raised. Sorry, said Strike, coughing and laughing simultaneously. Wasn't expecting it, that's all. He's quite an authority, I'll have you know, said Robin, mock offended. Professor of sheep, what was the rest of it again? Medicine, production and repro... Why is that so funny, Robin said, as Strike guffawed a second time. Dunno, maybe the production and reproduction thing, said Strike, and also the sheep. He's got 46 letters after his name I counted when I was a kid. Very impressive, said Strike, taking another sip of bourbon and attempting to look serious. So when did he first become interested in sheep? Was this a lifelong thing or did a particular sheep catch his eye when he was... He doesn't shag them, Strike. The detective's renewed laughter made heads turn. His older brother got the family farm, so Dad did veterinary science at Durham, and yeah, he specialised. Stop bloody laughing. He's also the editor of a magazine. Please tell me it's about sheep. Yes, it is. Sheep management, said Robin, and before you ask, no, they don't have a photo feature called Reader's Sheep. This time, Strike's bellow of laughter was heard by the whole bar. Keep it down, said Robin, smiling but aware of the many eyes now upon them. We don't want to be banned from another bar in London. We didn't get banned from the American bar, did we? Strike's memory of the aftermath of attempting to punch a suspect in the Stafford Hotel was hazy, not because he'd been drunk, but because he'd been lost to everything but his own rage. They might not have barred us explicitly, but try going back in there and see what kind of a welcome you get, said Robin, finishing one of the olives out of the dishes that had arrived for their first drink. Strike had already single-handedly finished the crisps. Charlotte's father kept sheep, Strike said, and Robin felt that small frisson of interest she always experienced when he mentioned his former fiance, which was almost never. Really? Yeah, on Aaron, said Strike. He had a massive house there with his third wife. Hobby farming, you know, probably a tax write-off. They were evil looking bastards. The sheep, that is. Can't remember the name of the breed. Black and white, huge horns and yellow eyes. They sound like Jacobs, said Robin. And responding to Strike's grin, she said, I grew up with massive piles of sheep management next to the loo. Obviously I know sheep breeds. What's Aaron like? She really meant, what was Charlotte's family like? Pretty, from what I can remember, but I was only at the house once. Never got a return invitation. Charlotte's father hated the sight of me. Why? Strike down to the last of his cocktail before answering. Well, there were a few reasons, but I think top of the list was that his wife tried to seduce me. Robin's gasp was far louder than she'd intended. Yeah, I must have been about 22, 23. She was at least 40. Very good looking, if you like them coke thin. How? What? We'd gone to Aaron for the weekend. Scheherazade, that was the stepmother, and Charlotte's father were very big drinkers. Half the family had drug problems as well, all the stepsisters and half-brothers. The four of us sat up boozing after dinner. Her father wasn't over keen on me in the first place, hoping for something a lot more blue-blooded. They put Charlotte and me in separate bedrooms on different floors. I went up to my attic room about two in the morning, stripped off, fell into bed, very pissed, turned out the light, and a couple of minutes later the door opened. I thought it was Charlotte, obviously. The room was pitch black. I moved over, she slid in beside me. Robin realised her mouth was agape and closed it. Stark naked, still didn't twig, I had most of a bottle of whiskey inside me. She, uh, reached for me, if you know what I'm saying. Robin clapped her hand over her mouth. And we kissed, and it was only when she whispered in my ear that she'd noticed me looking at her tits when she bent over the fire that I realised I was in bed with my hostess. Not that it matters, but I hadn't been looking at her tits. I'd been getting ready to catch her. She was so pissed I thought she was going to topple over into the fire when she threw a log on it. What did you do? Robin asked through her fingers. Shot out of bed like I had a firework up my ass, said Strike as Robin began to laugh again hit the washstand, knocked it over, and smashed some giant Victorian jug. She just sniggered. I had the impression she thought I'd be straight back in bed with her once the shock wore off. I was trying to find my boxers in the dark when Charlotte opened the door for real. Oh my God. Yeah. She didn't take too kindly to finding me and her stepmother naked in the same bedroom, said Strike. It was a toss up which of us she wanted to kill most. The screaming woke Sir Anthony, he came charging upstairs in his brocade dressing gown, but he was so pissed he hadn't tied it properly. 
He turned the lights on and stood there holding a shooting stick, oblivious to the fact that his cock was hanging out until his wife pointed it out. Anthony, we can see Johnny Winkle. Robin was now laughing so hard that Strike had to wait for her to compose herself before continuing the story. At the bar, a short distance away from the table, a silver-haired man was watching Robin with a slight smirk on his face. What then? Robin asked breathlessly, mopping her eyes with a miniature napkin that had come with her drink. Well, as far as I can remember, Scheherazade didn't bother to justify herself. If anything, she seemed to think it was all a bit of a laugh. Charlotte lunged at her, and I held Charlotte back, and Sir Anthony basically seemed to take the view that it was all my fault for not locking my bedroom door. Charlotte was a bit inclined that way too. But life in squats with my mother hadn't really prepared me for what to expect from the aristocracy. On balance, I'd have to say people were a lot better behaved in the squats. He raised his hand to indicate to the smiling waitress that they were ready for more drinks, and Robin, whose ribs were sore from laughing, got to her feet. Need the loo, she said breathlessly, and the eyes of the silver-haired man on the bar stool followed her as she walked away. The cocktails had been small but very strong, and Robin, who spent so much of her life running surveillance in trainers, was out of the habit of wearing heels. She had to grasp the handrail firmly while navigating the red carpeted stairs down to the ladies' room, which was more palatial than any Robin had visited before. The soft pink of a strawberry macaron, it featured circular marble sinks, a velvet sofa, and walls covered in murals of nymphs standing in water lily strewn lakes. Having peed, Robin straightened her dress and checked her mascara in the mirror, expecting it to have run with all the laughing. Washing her hands, she thought back over the story Strike had just told her. However funny she'd found it, it was also slightly intimidating. In spite of the vast array of human vagaries, many of them sexual, that Robin had encountered in her detective career, she sometimes felt herself to be inexperienced and unworldly compared to other women her age. Robin's personal experience of the wilder shores of sexual adventurousness was non-existent. She'd only ever had one sexual partner and had reasons beyond the usual for wishing to trust the person with whom she went to bed. A middle-aged man with a patch of vitiligo under his left ear had once stood in the dock and claimed that 19-year-old Robin had invited him into a dark stairwell for sex and that he choked her into unconsciousness because she told him she liked it rough. I think my next drink had better be water, Robin said five minutes later as she dropped back into the seat opposite Strike. Those are seriously strong cocktails. Too late, said Strike, as the waitress set fresh glasses in front of them. Fancy a sandwich, mop up some of the alcohol? He passed her the menu. The prices were exorbitant. No, listen, I wouldn't have invited you to the Ritz if I wasn't prepared to cough up, said Strike, with an expansive gesture. I'd have ordered a cake, but Ilse has already done it for tomorrow night, Robin guessed. The following evening, a group of friends, Strike included, would be giving Robin a birthday dinner, organised by their mutual friend. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to tell you, so act surprised. Who's coming to this dinner anyway? Strike asked. He had a slight curiosity about whether there were any people he didn't know about, specifically men. Robin listed the names of the couples. And you and me, she finished. Who's Richard? Max's new boyfriend, said Robin. Max was her flatmate and landlord, an actor who rented out a bedroom because he couldn't make his mortgage repayments without a lodger. I'm starting to wonder whether it isn't time to move out of Max's, she added. The waitress reappeared and Strike ordered them both sandwiches before turning back to Robin. Why are you thinking of moving out? Well, the TV show Max is in, it pays really well, and they've just commissioned a second series, and he and Richard seem very keen on each other. I don't want to wait until they ask me to leave. Anyway... Robin took a sip of her fresh cocktail. I'm 30. It's about time I was out on my own, don't you think? Strike shrugged. I'm not big on having to do things by certain dates. That's more Lucy's department. Lucy was the sister with whom Strike had spent most of his childhood because they'd shared a mother. He and Lucy generally held opposing views on what constituted life's pleasures and priorities. It distressed Lucy that Strike, who was nearly 40, continued to live alone in two rented rooms over his office without any of the stabilising obligations, a spouse, children, a mortgage, parent-teacher associations, duty Christmas parties with neighbours that their mother, too, had ruthlessly shirked. 
Well, I think it's about time I have my own place, said Robin. I'll miss Wolfgang, but who's Wolfgang? Max is Dachshund, said Robin, surprised by the sharpness of Strike's tone. Oh, thought it was some German bloke you'd taken a shine to. Ha, huh, no, said Robin. She really was feeling quite drunk now. Hopefully the sandwiches would help. No, she repeated, Max isn't the type to try and set me up with Germans. Makes quite a nice change, I must say. Do many people try and set you up with Germans? Not Germans, but oh, you know what it's like. Vanessa keeps telling me to get myself on Tinder, and my cousin Katie wants me to meet some friend of hers who's just moved to London. They call him Axeman. Axeman? repeated Strike. Yes, because his name's something that sounds like Axeman, I can't remember, said Robin with a vague wave of the hand. He's recently divorced, so Katie thinks we'd be perfect for each other. I don't really understand why it would make two people compatible just because they've screwed up a marriage each. If, in fact, if anything, you didn't screw up your marriage, said Strike. I did, Robin contradicted him. I shouldn't have married Matthew at all. It was a mess and it got worse as we went on. He was the one who had the affair, but I was the one who didn't want to be there. I was the one who tried to end it on the honeymoon, then chickened out. Did you, said Strike, to whom this was new information. Yes, said Robin. I knew, deep down, knew it was all wrong. For a moment, she was transported back to the Maldives and those hot nights she'd paced alone on the white sand outside their villa while Matthew slept, asking herself whether she was in love with Cormoran Strike.